Okay, everyone, thanks for uh, coming back. It's been a long day. Now we have uh, a, a, um, a panel which is uh, uh, very interesting and can may seem far uh, far reaching but uh, and uh, looking on a long time, but it's something which is very present because uh, what we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence, which really refers to a lot of these systems that are currently in use uh, in, in, uh, in our society, in critical sectors and incre increasingly are the main obje object of investments, of private and, and uh, state investments. And these uh, uh, artificial intelligence creates huge opportunities and, uh, and, and, and threats on the, on the short term and unfathomable you know, risks and opportunities on the long term. We have, uh, the uh, we're lucky to have uh, uh, great experts now to participate uh, today one that's going to be giving a keynote is now Eric Dretzler. Uh, he's a pioneer of, of uh, nanotechnology and uh, is a world-renowned world uh, uh, scientist in that area and recently has, done, has been doing uh, some foundational work with the Future of Humanity Institute led by Nick Bostrom, which is arguably the lead leading uh, thinker in this, in this, uh, in this area. Uh, so we'll let, uh, we'll let uh, Eric introduce uh, his area. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It is a great pleasure uh, to be here to participate in this conversation. I very much thank Rufo for giving me the opportunity because I think this is a conversation that uh, addresses issues at the foundation of our civilization and the future. So I'm currently with the Future of Humanity Institute where I'm co-leading the uh, AI safety uh, research group and I've shifted the topic of my talk a little bit to emphasize more AI for secu secure computing. Um, let's see here. There we go. Topics first, the explosion of AI technology and concern about it. Then, safe access to super intelligent tools, which has been widely thought to be very difficult to pose deep conceptual problems. Uh, I have been arguing that, I think with some success, that in fact safe access to super intelligent tools is a very practical and useful objective. And then the application of such tools for, for cybersecurity. Well, what we're seeing today in the new AI, which is quite unlike the old AI, deep learning, is what looks to me like a Cambrian explosion. In the Cambrian explosion we saw new, st new kinds of organisms, new body plans, new organizations of nervous systems and digestive tracts, a wild profusion of new body plans. What we're seeing in deep learning today is parallel. Uh, we're seeing more and more new architectures, more and, new, more and more new applications. Where a few years ago a deep network might have been five layers deep, uh, now last year or so they were 22 layers deep in a state-of-the-art image recognition system out of Google. This year, with a new principle of information flow, we're seeing networks that are 200 layers deep. We're seeing applications in areas that, are, that range, as they have for some time, from image recognition, through speech recognition, through natural language translation, all training by example, through applications, let's see, there's an architecture called a neural Turing machine, which addresses a memory space and can learn algorithms. We've seen the implication of implementation of differentiable stacks, stack structures that can be trained by gradient descent. And the list goes on. So what we're seeing is like a Cambrian explosion of at this point relatively simple systems but still impressively capable and quite different from what we've seen in the world before. What we can expect to see going forward is the emergence and increasing rate of progress in AI enabled AI driven AI development. We can expect to see these tools help researchers to generate new designs, test new designs, integrate designs to make new AI systems that are more capable of, among other things, designing better AI systems. That's a process that's been termed recursive improvement. It's been associated with the idea of superhuman, generally competent AI, which I think is a grave misconception, because designing AI systems is a very specialized task, and therefore a very specialized AI system can do it. We should not be looking toward general intelligence and saying as long as we don't have that, we're not going to have an intelligence explosion. The requirements for that are much lower. 
I would like to just emphasize that the systems we're seeing today in deep learning are not software as we know it. Here is a gadget described in full mathematical detail, which is at the center of, for example, today's machine translation systems. You have an array of memory cells. This is a kind of memory that in an array with the right inputs and training feedback and stoch stochastic gradient descent can learn algorithms that include speech recognition to transcript and translation from, for example, Chinese to English. Very interesting recent paper on that out of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So the observation here is that this mechanism is just matrix vector multiplications and wrapped around it, implied by the structure, as an algorithm for learning the parameters in those matrices. The algorithms are embodied in the flow of floating point numbers and nonlinear couplings between them in this system. And there isn't so much as a conditional branch that someone has coded into the, the core, the AI core of this. So these are not software as we know it. They're not intricate handcrafted structures. Instead, they are spontaneously organized patterns inside what are largely empirically engineered structures. They're wrapped in, of course, the usual infrastructure of, uh, of untrustworthy CPUs and operating systems and programming languages and sources of data and, and outputs to the rest of the world. But the core is something different. And the core is not something that is subject to the usual kinds of attacks, something, something that we'd have to think about in a new way. So Nick Vostrom, who heads FHI, uh, where I'm, I'm working, have been for several years, and I don't plan on leaving Oxford anytime soon, uh, published this book last year. If you've been reading a lot of concern recently about AI safety, it was stimulated by this book. Now, a problem with the response has been uh, really excessive anthropomorphism. This is, in fact, what was on the Oxford University <coughs> Press webpage uh, promoting the book that they published. So, the public tends to think of AI in terms of robots. Sophisticated people concerned with AI think of AI systems as very different from human beings, not the embodiment is ro in robots or control of robots as a consideration but secondary. And what I have been arguing is that we're still being too anthropomorphic, that intelligence and agency can potentially be quite separate. So a lot of attention has been given, and quite rightly, for, for a range of reasons, to the problem of intelligent agents that might have goals that we do not understand, or that we understand, but we don't understand the implications, where super intelligent pursuit of goals that are not our goals could have very, very bad side effects. So there are three questions. Uh, one is, does super intelligence necessarily imply agents? I think the answer is no. And that, I, I think, is widely agreed for a long time. The next question is whether AI developers can relatively easily, without conceptual breakthroughs, avoid developing agents? And I think the answer there is yes, and that is the line of research that I've been focusing on. Then the third question is whether the world can avoid having problems with AI agents, and I think we should assume the answer is no. That if one has super intelligent tools, those tools will be applied to build super intelligent agents, and you should worry about that for the reasons that are outlined in Nick Bostrom's book. The concerns are subtle, deeper, broader than one might think. However, they are not so broad that they can't be avoided by a development team. So the argument is that we can, in fact, have safe access to super intelligent tools, and I think we should be thinking about how to exploit them. Safe access to buttons that are more consistent when pressed. So just an outline of general approach, constraint by construction. If you start with, by hypothesis, to take the difficult case, an AI system that has been developed by means that are not well understood, it's been loaded with information that's broad and not well understood, and it's good enough, powerful enough at AI implementation that one has the potential for recursive improvement, then very straightforward argument says that it should be applicable to developing minimum size learning systems, simple learning systems, systems that don't have content until you put the content into them on the other side of a bottleneck. Control of the information input can lead to a range of fo focused specialists. One that, for example, is trained to be a mathematical proof system, very powerful proof system, need not know that the world has three dimensions. 
A system that does not deal with natural language does not need to have one word of natural language vocabulary. A common scenario is you have an intelligent system. What if it talks to people and persuades them to do something in the world? Well, it might not know that there is a world. And it might well, by construction, not have one word of vocabulary in any natural language. So many, many problems can be avoided by only providing knowledge that's relevant to the task and building a set of specialists. If you want to have more capability, you put specialists together to make systems that have components that have reasonably well understood in interfaces. Components need not learn. Typical software applications don't. Typ typical AI systems in application don't. There is a training phase, then an application phase. In an application, they simply perform the task with no memory, no task-to-task -task memory. And taking that concept forward and examining it more, more concretely, uh, I have outlined to the community a, an architecture where I can describe what the, the, what's in the, the, the uh, uh, open, open, open boxes between the arrows there. A composition of specialized pieces such that the system can do what people had thought was, was very, very dangerous, namely have a conversational interface with a system that's dealing with real-world problems. And yet people who are, I think, appropriately paranoid have looked at this and said, that doesn't seem to be a problem. It would be a very powerful, rather broad kind of tool, an engineering tool. You can substitute software engineering in there. And yet not posing an AI agent problem. So the argument is that the AI agent problem does not, that, that is, is avoidable, that superintelligence doesn't imply agents, that developers can avoid those problems, but we should assume that they will rise somewhere in the world anyway. And what that indicates is that we should be thinking in terms of what can be done with superintelligent tools to control superintelligence, among other things, but also for problems of IT security. If you'd like to read more about this approach, uh, there is FI FHI Technical Report 2015-3, which describes in, in some detail what some of the strategies and principles are behind what I just outlined. So superintelligence and cybersecurity. One consideration is AI as an asset. AI systems are going to be pieces of information and code that are presumably going to be very valuable. Potentially, in some applications, uh, very, very valuable to people who would like to uh, do, uh, see, they might be commercial competitors, they might be military competitors, they might be competitors in the world of surveillance. Many reasons why the AI code is something that would be a very valuable information asset. But that's a conventional problem. That's a question of can one control access to information that, that you have physical control of, at least temporarily. AI as a threat in itself, as an autogenous threat, is uh, an issue that I think is serious downstream, as I've suggested. Uh, IT security will be important in controlling information flows and managing those problems. Uh, that's a deep question that I will point to and, and step past. AI as an offensive tool, I think, should be a very serious consideration. Uh, the possibility of using it, using these, this, this kind of, of of, of intelligent software to identify exploits, analyze patterns of information, do interventions of various sorts. We're seeing some of that today. We will be seeing more and more. Eventually, we will have AI systems that at a range of tasks are superhuman in their capabilities. What I would like to say a bit more about, which I think has not gotten much attention and deserves consideration by this audience when we're looking toward the future, and we have to be looking over a substantial time interval, given the ambitions of this group. None of what we want to happen is going to happen fast. Therefore, it's going to happen in a world with different technologies than the ones we have today. I think it's likely that those technologies will include intel artificial intelligence at, in domain areas, a super intelligent level. So what might one, one do with that? Press this button five or ten times, first thing. Okay, so superintelligence for cybersecurity. So keep in mind, two aspects here. One is the quality of intelligence, and the other is the quantity. If you have a very competent uh, software analyst, then you have one software analyst. If you have a very competent AI software analyst, which probably can run on a GPU, on a, on a, on a personal computer, do 
be very powerful work for, for an already trained system. Training is, is something where parallel, parallelism and days are, are the kinds of uh, uh, the scale of parallel with many GPUs in many days is, is typical for a large training task. But for execution, they're very fast. So you should imagine having this super competent system in you know, thousands of instances if you want, you know, ten, 10 in every office if you want. So a large quantity of intellectual capacity and not just quality. So some applications, monitoring and recognition of novel attacks, recognition of attacks that people wouldn't recognize because they're subtle. Pattern recognition is a very great strength of, of existing uh, deep learning AI systems. Auditing designs, code, and configurations. Tireless attention to, to details that a person might overlook, perhaps learning patterns that a person can't learn. Support for secure programming. You think of someone architecting a system, implementing a system, and constantly interacting with an AI system that is aware of, recognizes security problems, is step-by-step step ensuring that the construction does not have unintended consequences in terms of patterns of information flow, in terms of patterns of access and control. And in addition to that, we're already seeing the emergence of significant pieces of code. For example, the, the uh, SEL4 microkernel uh, for which can be used as a hypervisor. It's very efficient. It's uh, L4 families used on cell phones. There's a machine checkable, formal proof of correctness of a range of important properties of that system. I think we can look forward to AI-assisted software engineering in which software is delivered together with a formal proof of correctness with respect to specifications and in which we have perhaps some aid in critiquing those specifications. Having systems that are very intelligent and can flag for us areas where what we've specified may not correspond to what we want. We should think about that again. And finally, looking toward an era of superintelligence, a very important concept is the ability to use superintelligent systems to counter, to control, uh, to, to constrain, uh, to, to implement, to prepare for the actions of other superintelligent systems. In the construction of specialized problem-solving intelligences, there's no problem that they, quote unquote, will conspire. Instead, the prospect is of having many, many different tools that can be applied to, among other things, checking each other and can solve difficult problems. No, if, if superintelligence is a threat, it seems that superintelligence is also the answer, and I don't know of another answer. And fortunately, it seems that that answer will be accessible. There we go. So eventually, a broader prospect, uh, employing what will be enormous intellectual resources by hypothesis, quantity, and quality. It's a prospect of being able to do affordable end-to-end re-implementation of IT infrastructures, parallel structures that accomplish similar functions, uh, uh, behaviorally compatible systems, re-engineered piecewise uh, systems, a level of, of, uh, of revision and replacement of installed base that would be inconceivable today will at some point become accessible. And that is something to think about and to consider what might that process look like when we have the tools and what might the tools look like. If we think about those problems, we're more likely to be asking the right questions, questions that will lead to the development of those tools and that will enable us to apply them effectively when we have them. So I'd like to start to end with a concept to consider. And I think I won't say much more than to say that the concept is one of law abiding, intrinsically law abiding, or at least very strongly supporting a social structure, an institutional structure that is law abiding, a strongly law abiding surveillance infrastructure. And what kind of civilization could we build if we knew how to do that and made good choices? Thank you.